Hey, but we are in um, the book of Isaiah, and uh, <clears throat> just as a, a way of review, uh, it's about salvation. Isaiah's name means the Lord saves, and it's the most quoted book in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus quotes it often. Paul quotes it often. Uh, the book of Isaiah, it starts out identifying the prophet Isaiah. Because the, the first six chapters seems like we are in the court of the almighty king God. Uh, and it's, it's like a trial is going on. The book starts very much like the book of Romans. Romans starts out as a book of salvation, but the first three chapters are about condemnation. I mean, he condemns uh, the, the pagan man who's never heard. He's, he condemns the moral man. He condemns the religious man. And when he gets all done, he says, everybody, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. <laughs> he says, it covers everybody. Everybody. And Isaiah is so much like Paul. I think Paul must have been borrowing from Isaiah because in these first six chapters, it's mostly about condemnation. But salvation is sprinkled in just like the apostle Paul does. So it starts out that Isaiah is the prosecutor. We've talked about this in chapter 1. The nation Judah and Israel, or, or, or Jerusalem, they are the defendants. We go a little bit further, and the jury is summoned, and it is heaven, and it is earth. But they're not going to make any decisions. They're called as a jury just to be witnesses of the judgment that God is going to render. We move a little bit further, and we find the charge. And the charge is this. Listen, the ox knows his master, and the donkey, he knows the manger. But my people, they are stubborn brats that are as dumb as an ox. They don't know their Lord. And it's a sad state of affairs when the so-called people of God don't know the Lord who is God. It's a sad, sad situation. He then brings up the evidence. It's their rebellion and their corruption and their perversions. And he summons and he actually does name calling. He calls them Sodom and Gomorrah. They are so sinful in their practice. He's not talking really so much about physically as much as he is spiritually. They, they have committed spiritual atrocities in the eyes of the Lord. He moves on and he says, here's the verdict. You're guilty. And then he offers them a pardon. I love that part. Right there, in the midst of all the condemnation, he says, listen. He says, you need to repent. You need to wash and cleanse yourself. You need to turn around from what you're doing. And he gives the final sentence, and the final sentence is an either or. Either you accept the pardon that the Lord has, and though your, skins be as, your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Even though they be red like crimson, they shall be like wool if you accept the pardon. But if you don't, then all you are, you are kindling wood, and what you do is the spark or the igniter, and you set yourself on fire. And that's what he winds up in the first chapter. The second chapter continues on. He picks up and he says, listen, I'm telling the same story. Because the very first verse begins the same way, talks about Isaiah, the son of Amos. The only thing missing is quoting of all the kings during which he reigned. And this vision seems to be given at the time when Ahaz is king, because he's a wicked king. You remember that he reigned during Uzziah, who was a good, God, good godly king, but he had leprosy. So his son Jotham co-reigned with him until Uzziah died. He was a good godly king. And then he had a son Ahaz, and Ahaz did that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. He is so despicable that he's practicing idolatry and takes his own son, a baby son, and places him on an altar to a foreign god and torches him. He offers him up as a sacrifice. So they've gone from really good godly days to horrendous days. And then after that, he has a son by the name of Hezekiah, who is the greatest king in the Old Testament. Go figure. How is it that a bad king can have a good son and a good king can have a bad son? You know how it is? This is how it is. No one can make a choice for someone else. I could not choose Jesus Christ for my children. They must do it themselves. 
And even if there's a wicked family, a child can say, I'm going to trust in the Lord and be my Savior, and out of wickedness can come a righteous person. And we're all going to stand on that day before God and give an account for only one person, myself. You too. You won't be able to say, but Pastor Dennis said. You know, it's going to be just between you and the Lord. So, and he said in the latter days, and when he says the latter days, he says he's looking past. He's, Isaiah saw, and he's looking way past. He's looking past the church age. He's looking past the rapture. He's looking past that time of great tribulation, and he's looking past that, and he sees the Lord returns, and he sets up a kingdom, and the kingdom we know from the New Testament is going to last for a thousand years. It's going to be holiness and righteousness. It's going to be joy. It's going to be health. It's going to be prosperity. The nations, uh, all the nations that are at that time are going to flood to the Lord, and they're going to worship him, and the word of God's going to go through the whole planet. It's going to be a great time. But then he said, just before that time, there's going to be that dark black time. And that dark black time is the, the tribulation. People are going to actually try to hide from God, climbing into rocks and, and asking the rocks to fall down and, so they can hide from the wrath of the Lord. And we know from the New Testament, Revelation chapter 6, it says they're going to call on the rocks to fall and, and cover them so that they can hide from the wrath of God and of the Lamb. Woo. He's talking about the last days of Israel. The chapter we enter into today is chapter 3. That was my summary of the first two chapters. All right. Chapter 3, we're back to the king's court. Isaiah's vision takes him right back to the king's court, and the key verse is found in verse 13. The Lord takes his place in court, and he rises to judge the people. <clears throat> we are in a courtroom at this point, and the Lord is the one who is judging, and it is the case of the Lord versus Judah and Jerusalem. Oh, this is the case. Uh, I'll give you a little heads up. In this case, the Lord wins. <laughs> Anytime it's the Lord versus someone, the versus loses. You, you get the picture here? This is God Almighty. But this is the Lord versus Judah and Jerusalem. And he says in verse 1, See now the Lord, the Lord Almighty, is about to take from Jerusalem and Judah. Listen, this is the case between the Lord and Judah and Jerusalem. And he begins by saying that it is about to take from I think America is a mess right now, and I am not the only one. This last week, there was a poll. 74% of Americans believe the country is on the wrong track. I was going to say, how many here think the country is on the wrong track? But I didn't want you to be 75 versus 25 if we were just typical, all right? So I, I just said, I went to the poll to find that information. America is on the wrong on the wrong track. Judah, Jerusalem, is in court, and they are on the wrong track. And the Lord is already, he's about to take away. This is how the Lord judges. He takes away. Notice what he says. See now the Lord, the Almighty, is about to take away from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support. Funny thing here. All the supplies of food and the supplies of water, he's going to take them away. God is intervening. There's this judge's intervention, and, and he starts to take away from his people. Notice what it says, their supply chain. Does that word ring a bell with you? You know, we couldn't even buy a car because they didn't have the stinking chip. The supply chain is gone. Couldn't even get a car. We went and looked. You see, our lease was up. We wanted to get a new car. But there were no cars to be bought because the supply chain was down. Not too long ago, you couldn't get formula for a baby because the supply chain was down. Listen, 
He's not talking about America, but America sure sounds like America when I go through this passage. And the thing that I notice is that the Lord is intervening and he's causing these things to happen because he's taking them away. It makes me ask the question, is God dealing with America like he's dealing with Israel or Judah and Jerusalem? Is he in our day, is this just a, it's just as a forerunner of what is to come because it gets pretty drastic in this passage. He goes on and says, not only does he take away the supply chain of all the necessary items for life, food and water, he goes on and he says, he takes away their military, their heroes and their warriors. God takes them down. Is it a surprise to you that a year ago that the United States took a major defeat and we just walked away leaving billions of dollars of equipment to terrorists and, and that, that we have still got Americans who are, are locked in Afghanistan and can't get out and private companies are still working to get in there and take out Americans because our military has failed? Whew. This is what's going on in Israel in the day of Isaiah, and it's also what goes on in the end times. And that's why the Bible says what is written in the Bible was written for you to take application and say, look around what's happening. Is God dealing with us right now? What's the question? Is he? Is he? Not only does he take the hero and the warrior, he takes the judge and the prophet. The judge is the one who administers justice and the prophet is the one that makes sure that the, the judges and the kings are doing what is right. It was, it was when King David was, was rendering a verdict that Nathan the prophet went in and said, you're the man. He held him accountable. Where is the accountability today? Where is the justice today? I see it in the news. We've weaponized politically the FBI, the CIA, the IRS, and every part of the bureaucratic government. This passage isn't talking about that, but I see it. This passage comes alive with application, both from Isaiah's day and the future day when God is going to judge the nation Israel. And I say, what? Maybe the hand of the Lord right now is taking away from a people that are a bunch of spiritual spoiled brats. Wow. He says the soothsayers and the elders, the soothsayers were the ones that were to predict the future and the forecasters. I have seen so many false forecasts, especially with the CDC, okay? We're finding out now masks didn't work at all. We're finding out right now that the nations that didn't even practice uh, having the vaccine have had the lowest rate of deaths and those that practice the highest system of trying to protect themselves from the COVID. They've had the highest rate of death. And so it says, how can we believe? He says, listen, those who are projecting the future that millions and millions of people are going to die, and it just turned out to be a fraction of that. Those who are saying, you've got to jab the kid, and now the kids are having heart conditions. Those are telling us you need, you need the jab even if you're pregnant, and they're having 80% more miscarriages. Come on. You cannot believe the soothsayers. Is it because... I can't answer, is it because? I don't know. But I, I do know there's an application here somewhere. He talks about the captains of 50 and, and the man of rank. God takes away those who restrain crime. And we got a country where the cry is defund the police. Now, how does that make sense? Could it be that God providentially is intervening and saying, that's what you want, that's what you'll get? Every parent's done that to their child, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says he's taken away the counselors, the advisors. I often wonder because I'm one of those skeptics. This is my opinion. It's only my opinion. It's political, but I think our president is just not all there. And that it's actually his counsel, his advisors, and they're giving him bad advice, they're taking our country down. That's exactly what was going on in Isaiah's day, and that's what's going to go on in the future there, only to a further intense degree in the period of darkness that is going to come when the church is gone. The skilled craftsman and the clever enchanter. <laughs> 
We have so pushed people to rack up this huge debt on their education that they get out and the guy that's paid for the education of an attorney can't find a job. We've done everybody that way, and now they're wanting to forgive that debt and make every one of us pay for somebody else's debt that they got themselves into. It's, it's, a, it's a mess, but that we don't have enough skilled laborers. I had a problem with my hot tub this week. It went down. Actually, it went up. I came home and found my temperature at 115 degrees. Needless to say, I didn't get in. <laughs> I shut it down. I called the company, and uh, I, they, I had to send them an email to, to come. And so the next day, I'm, I'm here at church, and I get a phone call, and he says, I'm, I'm sorry, because the power has been out, I can't get to your home at noon. I didn't even know he was coming. I said, wow, I like this company. Look at this service. He's, they didn't even tell me he's coming, and he's coming. He said, I'll be there a little later. And he was so prompt. I said, this guy, it cost me a fortune. You know why? Because skilled labor is in such demand. We got all these college grads have no skills, and we need these skilled laborers. Listen, this is the problem that was happening in Isaiah's day and was going to happen again in great intensity in a future day, and I see it already happening today. He goes on, he says, He's talked now, he shifts gear just a little bit and talks about the in incompetence. He says, this is, I'm going to take all that away, but he says, then I'm going to make something else happen. Watch what he says. I will make, I had to check my Hebrew on this because it's really, I am going to give. I'm, I, he's going to give you a little gift. It's kind of like in Romans chapter 1 when it says that they refused to have God, worship God as their creator, but worshiped idols, that God just gave them over to all of their insanity. Here it says, I'm going to give boys as their officials. Mere children will govern them. And what, he's gonna say, what he's saying is they're going to have incompetence running the nation. And I know some of us probably feel that way, and others say, well, I'm not so sure. They're going to have that incompetence. He goes on and he says, they're going to be oppressed. Listen to this. People will oppress each other. Man against man, neighbor against neighbor. Young, the young will rise up against the old, the base against the honorable. You know what this is? This is critical theory. That's what we call it. Critical theory from the bottom working up is setting lower class against upper class, and that's found in the critical thinking called communism. Communism was to take a, a group of people and isolate them and, and get them opposed to another. The, the, the bureaucrats or the, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat and get them against each other, the poor people and the rich people. You make your way up. It's the young against the old. That, that's the... That's back when I was a teenager. There was a saying, don't trust anybody over 30. <laughs> What's wrong? Boy, I'm sure glad that, that I expect people to trust them now. You see, you make your way up. Neighbor against neighbor. That's because my neighbor has one party placard in the yard, and I have a different party in my party placard in my yard because it's election time, and I got neighbor against neighbor, man against man. Critical race theory is nothing more than just adding to this list. Put one race against another so that we are constantly fighting. And you just don't understand me. I'm not going to let you understand me. I'm always going to blame you for what's wrong and what we have. What? And you know what the passage is saying? God gives this. It gets so bad, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that God sends a delusion to it. So you want to be that way? I'm going to help you along so that they believe the lie. Whew. Believe the lie. We have that nonsense even going on to this day. He says, not only uh, are they incompetent, the leaders are incompetent. A man will siege one of his brothers at his father's home and say, you have a cloak, you be our leader. It's going to get so bad for them, nobody wants to be the leader. Nobody wants to be the leader. Take charge of this heap of ruins. What? Israel's a mess. It's in ruins. 
But in that day, he will cry out, I have no remedy. I don't have a solution for this. Actually, it's a term for medicine. I'm not a doctor. I can't heal you. I have no food, clothing in my house. I do not, do not make me the leader of this people. I refuse. I won't lead you. That's, that's bad when no one wants to take the leadership. Usually somebody says, I got a great idea. Jerusalem here, you see, is staggering. You know, God raised up a nothing people. He said he chose, in Leviticus, he chose the least of all people and he raised them up. But now they're staggering as if they're drunk. Judah is falling. This is the fall of the nation. History is full of fall of nations. The fall of the Third Reich, the German powers in Europe. Before that was the fall of Rome. Before that, there's the fall of Israel. Listen, it is when you get yourself so puffed up, God says, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. And they had all their confidence in the fact that we have the temple. God would never let them destroy the temple. Oh, yeah? Yes, he did. They stagger Judah's falling. Their words and their deeds are against them. The Lord is against the Lord, they're defying his glorious presence. You see, God was in the temple <laughs> in those days. They're defying that. The defendants are incriminated. They are incriminated. He says, the look on their faces testify against them. <laughs> they're guilty. They're guilty. I give this little riddle to kids. Do you know how you could tell the boy was eating cookies? The crummy look on his face. Do you know how these people are going to look when they stand before the Lord of glory and all of his majesty and his splendor? Do you know what kind of look's going to be on their face? It is going to be guilty. It is so much so that in the book of Romans, it says, every mouth will be stopped and the whole world will become guilty before God. King James Version. New Modern Translation said they'll all become accountable to, to God. God's going to have the evidence, and there's not even going to be a but <laughs> guilty before God. Guilty before God. He goes on and says, the look on their faces will testify against them. They parade their sins like Sodom. They do not hide it. They showcase their sins. Some years ago, we were in Chicago visiting our, our son and uh, grandsons and grandkids. And, and while we were in Chicago, uh, I get a flyer slid under our hotel door, and it says, you might want to move your car off the street because a parade's going through tomorrow. And so I did. I went and got my car off the street, paid like 50 bucks to park it in the hotel parking lot because it's downtown Chicago. And sure enough, the next day when we went out, oh, went out the front door, forgot I put it in the parking lot. But here's a parade going by. It is the Gay Pride Parade. I've never seen such debauchery in all my life out in public. They parade it like Sodom, and Gomorrah, they parade it. They push it in your face. That's what he's calling. But, but I think really behind this is, is, is a metaphor that it's spiritual. It, this is spiritual debauchery going on. He says that they are incriminated by their actions. He says they're like Sodom that God rained down his judgment on. And he's, he's likening his own people to that. Wow, this is powerful. He says, woe to them. They have brought disasters upon themselves. This is self-inflicted. The rise and fall of the Roman Empire was self-inflicted. They, too, followed a path of debauchery. They followed a path of debauchery. The nation Israel, when they do this, they come to their end. They come to their end. Here's the word of hope in all of this. He's, he's in a section on condemnation. And then he says, and I love this. We're going to come back to it. I'm looking at the clock. Oh, we started late because of all the, 
<laughs> all, all the commotion at the beginning. Listen, he said, tell the righteous it will be well with them, for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. Oh, are you seeing this? All this ugliness is going around, all around them, all this is happening. And he says, but tell the righteous that it's going to be well with them. It's going to be well with them, for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. Listen. This, he says, but for the wicked, woe to the wicked, woe, disaster upon them. They will be paid back for what their hands have done. It's going to be a disastrous end for them. And then he moves on, and he says, not only for them, the youth who oppress my people, they're going to have a disastrous end. He says, listen, even the women who rule over them. The thing that amazes me about the women's movement, you don't hear a peep out of them about transgenders entering into women's sports. This is a violation against women, and they don't. He says, listen, no, the women are, are in power. You know, the women are in power in America. There's more women voters than there are men. Women are in power. Listen, the women do all the spending. I come home, I, I put my money I, to my wife, and my wife spends it. And... <laughs> it's true. If you check the economy... Women spend more than men do. They do. The women rule over them. He says here, this, he says, your guides lead you astray. God wants you to go down this path of righteousness. And they say, oh, let's take a little detour. You don't need to attend church. You don't need to read your Bible. You don't need to pray. He says, you don't need to pray for the nation. And you don't have to worry about politics, all that. He says, listen, there's a detour and you're being misled. And then we come to verse 13. Whew. And the Lord takes his place in court. He rises to judge the people. The Lord here implicates the guilty. The Lord enters into judgment against the elders and leaders of his people. The elders and leaders of his people, they, they are the rulers of Jerusalem. He says, it is you who have ruined my wine press. It's like me saying, it's Washington that has ruined America. Those inside the beltway, those making all the decisions for us, they don't represent us anymore. They represent themselves in special interests. That's what he said. You have ruined the vineyard. The vineyard is Israel. You have plundered from the poor in your houses. Listen, they plunder the poor. They, they're taking the tax from the little guy, and they live lavish lives. That's what's going on in our day. It's going gonna, it's gonna to continue and even be worse in the future. This is, he said, what do you mean by crushing my people and grinding their faces of the poor? So I put this guy on a millstone. See the millstone going around? He is getting ground down. That's what I like. He says, this is what the leaders are doing to the people, to the people, declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty, piling up of the names of God because it's serious. He turns from the leadership to the women. And the Lord says, the women of Zion, these are the elite ladies uh, of Zion. And he, we get a really description of how elite they are. They're haughty. They're walking along with outstretched necks. You know, they really think they're somebody. He, he says, they're flirting with their eyes. I can't, if you got a close-up, you'd say, I'm blinking a lot, you know. <laughs> they're flirting. And you say, please don't do that. That's not very flirtatious. <laughs> but they're flirting with their eyes. They're tripping along. they kind of got to skip. Like, I'm somebody. We, 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 we would say, she's got a wiggle in her walk. She, she's strutting. Okay. <laughs> with, with ornaments jingling on their ankles. So she's got an ankle bracelet, but it's a noisy one. So every, she's drawing all this attention to herself. Isn't that the way our political powers are? Because I think behind all of this, he's, he's condemning the politics of the day. The men who are in power, okay. The women who are in power, okay. He goes on, he keeps, he says, in that day the Lord will snatch away. Watch, he's going to snatch away all that beauty and glamour she thinks she's got. Boom. She's going to be like a beggar on the street. 
to snatch away all their finery, the bangles, the headbands, the, the crescent necklaces, the earrings, the bracelets, and the veils, and the, the headdresses, the ankle chains, the sashes, the perfume bottles, and the charms, and it says in the signet ring, and the nose ring, and the, the fine robes, and the capes, and the cloaks, and the purses. Now I know he's really messing. When they take a woman's purse away, he's really, really messing here. And the mirrors, what, they want to look very glamorous. And the linen garments, and the tiaras, and the shawls, he's taking everything away. He says, instead of fragrant, nice perfume, there's going to be this stench. Instead of a sash, he's going to get a rope. Instead of well-dressed hair, <laughs> bald. Instead of fine clothing, Sackcloth, instead of beauty, branding. This terrible picture. This is judgment. Judgment. He turns from the women, he turns to the men. You see, he's moved from the leaders of the country. He's now moving down, and he's working through the ranks of the people. He's getting down to the people, and we're now down to commoners. You see, it's, it's like that in America. We can blame it on Washington all we want, but we put them there. We voted them there. We voted them there. Your men will fall by the sword and your warriors, uh, your warriors in battle. There's going to be a horrific death because he goes on, he says, and the gates of Zion, they will lament and mourn, destitute. She will sit on the ground. Now, I got the picture of a lady sitting there and she's mourning, but it's actually the gates are fallen and, and the gate is here. I got standing, but the, the, the country has been toppled. The, the country is a mess. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1 actually should be in chapter 3. The break there is not inspired by God. It's man-made break, but it should go into chapter 3 and it says, in that day, this is how bad it is. Seven women will take hold of one man. There's going to be so many men gone, it's going to be seven to one. Seven to one. And they're going to take hold of the man and say, we will eat our own food and we'll provide our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Marry me. Take away our disgrace. Wow, this is, this, this is... So, so what's the whole point of all of this? The whole point is this. The Lord takes his place in court, and he rises to judge the people. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Judgment is coming. I got three thoughts that I want you to take. I want you to take with you. When you appear in the king's court, because we all will, Someday we're all going to stand before God and give an account. There's three thoughts, three thoughts. Number one, your face will testify against you. You can put on a happy, smiley, wonderful face here in church and pretend like everything is well. You know Jesus and you're happy and all of that. That face won't show when you stand before him. It'll be the real who you are so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world will become guilty before God or held accountable to God, Romans chapter 3. You're guilty. Every last one of us are guilty. Guilty, guilty, guilty. The judgment, though, will be self-inflicted. Whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's Son, his one and only. What you believe in this life determines whether you're going to be judged or receive reward in the next. It's just that simple. Final thought, just what I really want to take. It's the only positive theme in the whole chapter. Tell the righteous it will be well with them, for they will enjoy the fruit of their works. Whew. I got a principle I think is true in the Bible. God always separates the righteous from the unrighteous when he judges, always. It was true in Noah's day. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord because he was a righteous man, and the Lord would not bring impending disaster and judgment upon the world until Noah had the ark built, and he was safe inside, 
Then it began to rain and pour. The floodgates of heaven were opened and above the, the bottoms of the seas, and the flood came and wiped out all humanity except for the eight people inside the ark. He always separates the righteous from the unrighteous when he judges. It was true in Lot's day. God was going to go and send his angels into Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and Abraham pleaded, if there's just 10 righteous people, will you spare them? He agreed to that. He went into Sodom and Gomorrah, and there were not 10 righteous people. But before he destroyed it, the angel said, Lot, get your family and get out of here. And Lot and his family took off. It was actually Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. And you know the story. His wife turned around and looked back, and they told him not to look back, and she turned to a pillar of salt. She craved for the old more than the new. And then judgment fell. God separated the righteous from the unrighteous. In the New Testament, Jesus tells a parable where a man went out and he sowed in his field uh, wheat. And along came another enemy, and he sowed in it tares or weeds. And they both grew up together. And then the question was asked in the, in the story Jesus is telling in the parable. He says, and then the servants came and said, Lord, what should we do? Should we go pull the weeds out? And he said, no, if you pull the weeds out, you're going to take some of the wheat with it. He says, let it go to the end, and in the end we'll separate the wheat from the tares. There's a separation. You see, we're living in the midst of terrible, wicked times, despicable Things that the Word of God says are wrong, they say are right. God is waiting. A day is coming when, hey, we're, we're living in these times, but when we come through, we're the wheat. He's going to separate all those tares from the wheat. And the story says when they, he says, he explains this parable. He says, hey, the evil one, Satan, is the one who sows the tares the seed of the word of God lands on good soil, but the tear lands on other soil, and it wants to choke us all out. But in the judgment, he's going to separate the, the seed from Satan from the seed of God, and they're going to burn the tares. He's very emphatic, very emphatic. He always separates the righteous from the unrighteous. You see... At the end of the tribulation, before Israel goes into the kingdom, he separates between the goats and the sheep. Matthew chapter 25. The goats are those who do not believe they're on his left. And he says, depart from me. <laughs> but those who, oh, who know the Lord, they're the sheep. They hear my voice. They follow me. They go into the kingdom. He always separates between the righteous and the unrighteous when he judges. God always separates. We're in a church age, and this is why I believe the rapture comes before the tribulation, because the tribulation is a time of wrath. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 10 says, God has not appointed us to wrath. We separated. He takes us out of the world before the tribulation period comes. He always separates between the righteous and the unrighteous. So the deal is this, you have to accept Jesus to become righteous in him. All of our righteousness, as the Bible says, is filthy rags, filthy rags. People say, I'm going to, my good outweighs my bad. God says, your good is filthy rags. I don't want to get too graphic here, but it's really bad. It's like a rag of a menstruation cycle. Okay, that's it. The best you have, that's it. My good's gone away. No, it's not. You need someone else's righteousness. The Bible said God made Jesus to be sin, the one who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. We might become the righteousness of God in him. When I accepted Jesus Christ, I became righteous in Jesus Christ. Now, if I really accepted Christ, that changes my life. For if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. I have a new life, a new lifestyle that I want to do what is right. Do I always do it? No, but I want to. He put the want to in there. I don't want to do what all the world's doing. I want to do what God wants me to do. He says here, listen, he separates the righteous from the unrighteous. You need to accept Jesus to become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Wow. 
that time. Let's pray. Father, someone here has reflected upon the thought, how will it be when I stand before God? And we know if we stand in our own righteousness, we're going down. But if we've accepted Christ, clothed in his righteousness, transforming our lives, we will be saved. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Saved. Right now, someone needs to pray. Father, I'm a sinner. Save me. Clothe me in the righteousness of Jesus so that I can spend eternity with Christ. This I pray in Jesus' name.